Hello everyone, I haven't made any videos for a while but I thought I'd better make one now while this TV in front of us is working at the moment. There's a bit of a story behind this one and perhaps I should just state some of the facts about it first and give you an idea how big this unit is. You can see the satin and the little PS1 on the floor in front of the television and it's not on a stand by the way, this is the TV by itself, it has its own stand built in. It's very big, a very big CRT. It's 89 centimeters in size. The weight of this unit, it's the heaviest in my collection and I don't know exactly, but I would guess that at a very minimum it would be 100 kilos, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's 120 plus. Uh, as I said, the unit's built into it, so it's a bit of a cheating weight, you know, it's got its, its stand added to the, the total of weight. <clears throat> Uh, I'm not going to concentrate too much on the picture at the moment. Um, we'll go for a little look around the sides and back and, and get an idea because I'll probably film it again later tonight or in the middle of the day and there's a lot of sun and a lot of glare so if I do it at night time it's going to be easier to see the picture anyway. So we'll go for a wander. This TV is a Lerva. Uh, it comes, um, was made in uh, I believe 1994. I think that's when the owner said that they bought it. Cost, believe it or not, around ten thousand dollars. It would have been the flagship, no doubt, uh, in the day. There's your Lerva badge. There. We'll get to what the exact model is in a moment. <clears throat> this is easy to miss. Here's a little panel that slides out with, with uh, the, that calls up the menu. You can scroll through the menu with that button, and then there's your minus and plus to change the values of, of the settings. Over here, there's uh, the power button. Um, one of the reasons for a lot of glare at the moment is that the screen has an actual another layer of glass on the front, a nice curved piece of, of glass that um, the manual calls it a filter, but I don't actually think it really does anything but detract from the picture because it just causes extra glare. Uh, it, it certainly cosmetically makes it look good. If you take the glass panel off, it does look a bit funny without it. But I'm not a big fan of these glass panels on the front because they're fragile as all shit and they will break quite easily. Um, if we go around the side here, you will notice that there is a handle. That handle slips out and it's it's got some foam padding on it. Steel handle to help, help carry the juggernaut that it is. Note the styling there. We'll go over the other side. Again, another handle to help carry it. There are actually a couple of wheels on the back underneath that help move it about, but the front doesn't have any wheels. It's just like sits on the wood there and, it, and it's still quite awkward to move around. I think they should have just built wheels on the front too. Let's get to the ID of this thing. So it is a Lerva branded TV and the actual model is Art and getting specific, it's the 9500 sat. I think the Lerva Art debuted in 1985. I don't know if they made them that, this big back then, but as I said, this is the 1994 model. I think this is the last one of these that used the C9003 chassis, which is a 50, 60 hertz chassis. It's not a 100 hertz job. I made sure that it wasn't that. I've seen one model newer than this that uses a 100 hertz chassis, <clears throat> probably the 95 model. And then I'd say this line was discontinued in either maybe 96 or 97. I don't see it in any of the catalogs, so it had a fair run. Um, at the back here, well, you'll note that there doesn't appear to be any connections whatsoever, but what you can do is actually remove this plastic cover here at the back with these four fastening objects. I've probably just done it up instead of undoing it. All right, that's certainly got to go. They've got to go vertically. Okay, it's going to come up here. This is just to cover up all the cords and stuff at the back. So here's the back exposed. There's there's two SCART sockets and the PlayStation 1's hooked into the bottom one. That takes RGB. The upper SCART takes S-Video. I haven't tried it yet, but it does state there S SVHS. And I've seen it in the menus. You can change the input of the TV to accept S-Video. There's your audio out, RCA form. And there's a few other connectors over here. I'm not sure what they do. Don't believe that that's a VGA module there. That's just a nine pin D sub connector. I think this is a satellite accessory card. I'm not sure how or what it does. 
it seems that the RF comes out of the main chassis and back into it, sort of a piggyback drop. Don't know what's going on there, but it doesn't really serve any purpose for me. Um, you'll notice that there is a, a fair sized cavity in there. We'll go to the front and I'll show you what that's for. By the way, I've got Mega Man 1 on the PlayStation 1 showing now. I should say actually Rock Man to be exact. That's just running in the background there. I'll shift these consoles out of the way. Now this panel here on the front, this mesh, metal mesh panel actually folds down, unclicks and comes down. And then there's the front of the cavity that I talked about before. You could put in a VCR or something. To be honest, it's not much room considering the total amount of space that is down here, but behind this felt here we've got the, the speaker system of the TV. It does put out a fair bit of sound, but I'm not that impressed. I'm never impressed really with any TV sound. I still prefer stereo any day of the week, a dedicated stereo. So I'll put this back up again. What I'll do now is I'll take the back cover off the TV. It's actually pretty easy. There's only four, four screws that hold this big piece of plastic in two up the top and, and uh, one there and one there. It's it's pretty good TV to work with actually despite its size, despite it being heavy to shift around. Righto, the back's off now. Um, the first thing that struck me when I looked inside it was the metal shielding. First lever I've seen that's had metal shielding around the back, typically a Sony thing that Sony does. I was always curious to know what tube was inside it. Philips being the staple brand for Lerva televisions, I was wondering what was going to be inside this one. Uh, it's actually um, a Mitsubishi tube. There on the label, uh, you probably can't see it, it does say Mitsubishi. I think it's made in Japan. I think it's made in Japan. You wouldn't be surprised if that was the case with Mitsubishi. Um, you know, they are makers of big displays and big tubes and those sorts of things, so that's where Lerva's gone to get their tube. Um, there's the C9003 chassis. Uh, the one thing I will say with it is it got a crap load of cables running from it all over the place. So I, when I uh, pulled it apart, I made sure that I put labels on the plugs and sockets for all the cables so I knew where to put them back when I put it together. But even as it is, I still do not do every cable. There's a couple of, like, there's one there that I haven't plugged in, an earth cable there, and there's an earth cable somewhere else that I haven't plugged in. So, you know, I haven't got it perfect, but... It is actually working um, fairly properly. Um, I should tell you that story that I was going to tell you, you know, at the start. Uh, this TV was on eBay a while back, probably nine months ago, if not longer, and the owner had tried to sell it several times. I didn't know about that, but I just saw it on eBay one day for 30 bucks, starting starting auction price, and um, it didn't sell, so I arranged to come and have a viewing of it. I took my Dreamcast to the house and plugged it in and it took a little while to actually get it, the picture to sync in properly because you've got to go in the menus, you've got to turn it on to RGB, the input, and you've got to turn it on to NTSC because this was a Japanese Dreamcast that I had going at the time. So I eventually got it going. I wasn't blown away by the picture, but you know, I was impressed by the size of the unit. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to buy this and um, didn't cost much to buy, but the transport was bloody dear. You know, I had to take this thing a few hundred Ks and hire a ute to transport and get a friend to help me lift it up and all of that so we got it back to my house back here in the shed where we are now and got it off the ute and got it in the shed and hooked up a console turn turn it on and i reckon within about 10 seconds there was a bang inside the television and the green power line went off and it went into standby mode and and she stopped working from there on in so naturally i um I opened it up and had a good look at the chassis and I found the culprit. If you've got a fair size sort of pop bang sound, you know that something's physically going to be changed inside. You know, you're not going to get an explosion like that. I mean, it wasn't massive, but something's going to something's going to show. And what it turned out to be, it was this flyback here. Mine output transformer. You can see there it's coming up good on the camera. Now see how it looks like all melted. That's rooted. That's absolutely stuffed. Common thing for television chassis to die from is... um from this um, transformer dying. This was the, the cause of it. So, you know, I put the TV aside for a few months and I eventually got around to finding a replacement flyback, which was from a company called Donberg in Ireland. It wasn't a genuine Lerva one, but it's a third party one. I believe it was 
being made in Spain. And um, so I got the fly back a while ago. But uh, I'm pretty handy with a soldering iron, but I'm not really proficient in electronics. I'm just an amateur. And I thought, well, I could put the new fly back inside, which I have done now. I thought I could put it in, but you know, what else might have malfunctioned on this chassis am i risking the new flyback by putting it in but one day I, I was bored and i thought bugger it i'm going to put the fly back in solder it in put the chassis back in hook it all up turn it on and see what happens and i did that and so far so good tv's been running for probably eight hours not continuously now but in total time since i put the new fly back in it and it seems to be going pretty good so fingers crossed it keeps going and that's why I, I really had to make a video now because it's not the first, well, it wouldn't be the first time that a TV's worked while I've been filming and then it died again afterwards. So at least we've got it on record here now. And um, the picture is pretty good. Why not? Why not comment on it now? We won't worry about the glare and stuff. Um, uh, and the satin actually looks a little bit dark on it. I, I have noticed that the satin is a darker, has a darker RGB than the PlayStation on some televisions and then on others I can get it perfect, perfect brightness. But had the satin on before it was a bit dark um there's just a couple of issues i'm having right now there's a fair bit of um splotchiness it's magnetized down in there and i haven't been able to remove it yet but i think that's a minor gripe at this stage and the only other thing is there's a fair bit of a, a misconvergence issue here down the bottom i should put a crosshatch pattern on to show you that but what i did is i attempted to converge the pattern with the convergence rings on the back there now if you know anything about these things generally what happens in the factory is it gets aligned and then they put a stripe of paint or a stripe of glue across those convergence rings there where that red paint is right in the right there they put a line across it so you know where it is where it's set that's right where it is so if you move those dials out then you get in a bit of trouble when you can't get things converged properly you just move the the dial convergence rings back and you should be right well when i first looked at it the line of paint wasn't in a straight line so i thought that's the cause of the misconvergence i'll align those all up so the paint's all straight but that actually made the television worse and i didn't have the position um, i should have put a paint mark line on there myself where it was originally so i, I knew i could go back but i'm in a bit of strife now because i'm i've probably got worse convergence than i did to start off with but um what i'm going to do is when i get a mate down here we're going to we're going to converge the tv i just i need someone here to do it with because it is quite a dangerous procedure you have to adjust this with the television on and it's it's a risky thing and i'll just do it when i've got another pair of eyes in the front that can tell me what's going on so we'll get that right okay i've got the crosshatch convergence pattern up I did say earlier I was going to film this at night time and I did this stuff, but going on the spur of the moment, so I'll do it now. I've got the pattern generator there in the VCR slot, in that cavity I showed you before. Handy. Now, it doesn't look too bad from a distance, actually. Um, pretty good linearity. It's, it's fairly straight. I haven't fine-tuned it to the utmost, but it's satisfactory for now. Uh, the convergence I'm talking about, the misconvergence, is down here. You can see you can see it if the camera will sort of keep focused on it. Yeah, see that red and the blue outside the white there? It's a bit nasty down there, just left of lower centre. That's the area that I've got to work on and and get converged because it is it is noticeable. Uh, I notice it on text and stuff, and it does annoy me a little bit. And I've got to work on down here this this magnetised area. It's got to be degaussed, um, and you can see it's out of convergence there right in the corner not unusual for that to happen i'm not too worried about being right in the corner but uh the picture was actually slightly rotated clockwise i gave the the yoke i loosened the clamp on the yoke and just gave it a bit of a nudge and i think that's helped it i think it's i think it's tilted just right now that was a bit of a fluky victory so you know the image is not bad not too bad i'll keep working on it and i'll get my friend here and we'll get this convergence lined up as good as possible I think another thing we might have to try out and this was done in the factory you can see there on the tube that there's there's a magnet that's been placed there to probably do the same thing converge some stray beams there well I'm going to try the same thing and see how I go with that see if we can improve the picture 
Should also make mention that when I went into the previous owner's house to demo this TV and put the Dreamcast on it, I did hear a lot of noise from the back of the TV. And I'm not talking about sound from the speakers, I'm talking about actual component sounds. The flyback, I think, was arcing at the time, so I had warnings then. And as I said, it blew up when I got it home, but we've got it going now. Uh, the remote for this TV is the standard, the standard sort of black lure remote of the time. Uh, the service menu is quite easy to get into. All you need to do is first of all use this little panel here to get get the menu up. And oh, I'm going to have to use. Um, oh, I'll just tell you how to do it. I can't do it while I'm holding the camera. But you click the button and hold it when it gets onto service, and then you press the menu button on the remote. I'll just put the camera down to do that. It's a pretty easy way to get into the service menu, to be honest. So there it is. You got um, you got your choices in there to your vertical size and horizontal size and position. I wish there was a vertical position in there. I haven't found that yet. That's annoying. I really need that. But, um, easy to get into there. And then we can get back out. I think lastly I'll show you the manual for it. Oh, I don't know where the manual is now. Who knows where it is? But I got that with it too, fortunately. Um, that's pretty much the Lerva art. Not too bad of a TV. I'm just glad it's come back from the graveyard and that I could show it to you. It's not a bad unit. Speaking of which, I see one on eBay now in Sydney for a 99 cent starting price. Um, its front glass panel that I showed you before is um, is broken on it, or it's missing actually. And I don't know if this is if it's a 100 hertz model or what it is, but you know if you're looking for one, there's one right now. Uh, these things are pretty. Uh, pretty pretty big and awkward to move around so it mightn't be your first choice in a TV I, I've seen them go for you know even a couple hundred dollars and then other times it won't go for anything so it's it's just the thing of the moment really not too bad of a unit I think you get better picture quality in a smaller screen your 68s your 66s those lovers with the Phillips tubes are still better but if you want the big size you want the authentic 15 kilohertz CRT look not a bad pick so Thanks for watching once again. I apologize for no videos of late, but I've got a few more to put up, so see you next time.